the vast empire of Manabatapa uh, is in such decay that no one has dominion over it because everyone has power there. The vast empire of Manabatapa is in such decay that no one has dominion over it because everyone has power there. That's from King of Portugal to his Viceroy of India in 1719. All right. Yeah, this is chapter 11. Decline and fall. Yeah, decline and fall. Okay, what's going on? This is the King Camel Jube podcast. And Jube means message. And we're going to deal with this. We're at almost the very end dealing with the, the decline and fall. Okay, it's an introduction to African history geared just for you. It's designed to foster a life of learning. And it will be once a week, go over a few readings on the continent. And of course, we are, people are asking, are there any other civilizations in Africa outside of Kemet? And I believe that we have proved that, okay? We have went through a lot of lost cities and we're going to continue, okay? This is the sub-regions of Africa. We're in the southeastern region right around here in the central part of Africa, and we're still in the book, The Lost Cities of Africa by Basil Davison. Check it out, okay? Uh, I have the link in the description. It's an Amazon affiliate I earn from qualifying purchases. Um, check it out. But uh, also, uh, this is, we have two more weeks. Two more weeks, two more chapters, chapter 11 and chapter 12, okay? So uh, we have two more weeks to go. Summer school book announcement is coming soon. Matter of fact, we'll talk about that shortly. But we had a recap. How was there some points of comparison? If you remember from last week, we talked about that. How were there, how was there some points of comparison? When was the period of greatness? Okay, according to them. Um, and I'm gonna try to add that video in here also. And was there a point of origin? Hmm, was there a point of origin? And what is now required, right? That was from last week. Uh, check it out. Now, of course, we're going to identify and discuss the major concepts in the book entitled The Lost Cities of Africa, Chapter 11, The Decline and Fall. That is his title. That is his title. And yeah, I had to go ahead and lay down that heavy uh, concept at the very beginning, okay, because this is the route we're going. Uh, unfortunately, we can't romanticize everything and all is well everywhere in Africa. No, we had to deal with the reality of the, the, the decline and fall, okay? The vast empire of Manamatapa in such decay that no one has dominion over it because everyone has power there. Everybody. And this is the outsider saying this. The king of Portugal to his viceroy of India in 1719. This dude in Portugal basically gossiping to somebody in India about Africa. That it's 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 free reign right now. This is 1719. Okay. Here's the essential question: What's the fabric? What is the fabric of society? Nomads at the gate. When did when did the gate flung open? When did it happen? Or has it been ajar the entire time? Okay. These are the essential questions. What's the fabric of society? Nomads at the gate. When uh, when did the gate officially flung open or swing open according to the book? Or, in my opinion, has it been ajar the whole time? Hmm. Okay? Now, get ready for summer school. This summer, the, we're going to deal with the wonderful Ethiopians of the ancient Kushite Empire. This is a classic. Yeah, go ahead and get, get that because this is a light read, a short read, but we're going to get into it. The wonderful Ethiopians of the ancient Kushite Empire. Check it out. Um, get your copy before get your copy before we kick off summer school in June. Uh, check it out. All right. Now, what what's the fabric of society? That's his question. Okay, what's the fabric of society? Um, my response: It will be the people. Okay, it, and of course, you if you think about fabric or. Um, some kind of cloth is it, woven together. Okay, so my response would naturally be the people, uh, Bantu people, uh, Bantu people to be exact. 
people who practice Ubuntu or togetherness or um, a commonality. We may not agree on everything, but let's work together. Uh, that's what it's about. And, you know, we that's still the fabric of society. If you think if you think about it, that is still what's going on today. So it's very important that we we practice that work together. Right now, according to Davidson, the the decline and fall of the Empire Manabatapa was the disappearance of the culture on which it was based. Man. Yeah. Yeah. It's on page 315. Yeah. He says, you know, it's it's happening. And, and based on his research, um, it was the disappearance of culture on which it was based. Why did that happen? What was going on? Okay. Uh, some of the Iron Age culture continued to grow. Yes, it is true. There was elaborate ruins of Dolo Dolo and Kami and Yanga. They were still intact. But there were some underlying issues there that the archaeologists and scientists observed that this fabric was being torn down or cut or severed. What was it? What was going on? Okay. So according to Davidson, you can see the fabric of society in various regions of Africa on the coast based on proximity alone. It went from Vasco, the Vasco da Gama's description of the civilization full of coastal cities. But then by the time they get there, by the time they get there to the coastal lands, it was wrecked by the 18th and 19th century. So it goes from Vasco da Gama's um, fully realized cities Beautiful, full of color, full of life, vibrant in the 1500s to a couple of centuries later, they are wrecked. What happened? Why did it decline? What was going on? Okay. As a matter of fact, in the book, he says he was deeply impressed by the civilization. But then, a couple of centuries later, it's in it's in disarray. And Africa has not not only failed to keep up with advancing society, they they've fallen behind. Why is that? Why is that? What 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 happened? This is their observation. Okay, this is their observation. You guessed it. It was slave trading. Slave trading on an altogether. This is what Davidson was saying. An altogether unprecedented scale had done its degrading work. Mm -hmm. By the 18th, uh, 18th and 19th century, slavery was in full force on both sides of the continent. Okay? Not just in West Africa, dealing with the uh, Western side, but the Arab slave trade was handling uh, slavery also. They had their hand in it also. We just can't be heavy-handed talking about the Westerners. There's some people from the East doing the same thing. Yeah, unprecedented scale. All right. And then, of course, it's the slogans of uh they it was everywhere. Propaganda about natural African inferiority was stamped in the minds of Europeans. That was the propaganda was okay, they they're meant to be slaves. Okay, let's fast forward. They should be in jail. See how they act? They should be like this. They should be in this condition. No. Okay? So that's what was happening even then. Okay? The fabric of society was being tore up through slavery and resulting in the cultural decentralization. All right? So much of the fabric of African civilization, at least in coastal regions, was rent or ruined and seemed to justify contempt. So by the time a lot of Europeans in the in the latter centuries came out there, they said, yeah, it's, it's, it's out of there. But this is a total different contrast to what Vasco da Gama was saying. Okay? But it still doesn't justify slavery. But they they saw this devastation. They said, yeah, we can we can do what we want. That's what the Europeans were thinking. Let's continue. Okay, that was the coast, but in Central Africa, the story was different. 
It was varied. However, it was varied depending on who's doing the talking, but it remained advanced with this manifold mythology of, of course, African savagery and chaos. They did not want the Africans to be great. They didn't want the word to go out that Central and South Africa was still doing their thing. They were still um, maintaining and sustaining power. We're, we're now in the southern part of Congo, southern part of um, Zimbabwe. We're in that area. And so very few Europeans was going down that way during this time. Okay, so we have to understand that Africa is large. And they didn't have cars and trucks to get, to get there. They had to actually make their way through there. Okay? So, in 1831, in 1831, they gave a different narrative. They gave a different story in, of Central Africa. Remember, the coast in the 1800s was ruined. But in Central Africa, it's a different story. It was the encounter of the Portuguese and the ruler Alunda in southern Bakongo. This narrative is totally different. This story was different, y'all. He met the Mwani Anganja. The Mwani Anganja. I may mispronounce it, y'all. Uh, family from Congo, please uh, let me know. People from that area, shout out to the people of Congo. They are going through it. Um, and we're going to actually kind of get a better understanding as time go on. But yes, Portuguese ran across the king of the Congo, okay, or Mata Kazimbi. Kazimbi. Mata Kazimbi, right? So the ruler of the southern Congo, whose lineage went back by tradition into the remote past. So this guy here had had an established lineage, had an established royalty for, for a very long time. I can't say thousands of years. I can't say all of that. But it was a long time, and it was it was established. It was set up, okay? And they had it going on, okay? Now, on the morning of November 29th, they were summoned to the presence of the Muataka Zambi. These foreigners who came into Bakongo, get this, they were summoned. Okay, you just didn't walk it. They were summoned. Hey, now you might be able to come. And of course, I have pictures of here of the, the King of Congo with an Egyptian picture at the bottom. Very similar. Okay, but they were summoned to the presence of Mwata and Zambi. Okay, and I got to read this. The, the soldier, this page... This is page uh, 317. The soldiers stationed there were the garrisons of Lunda, consisting of about four to 5,000 men. That's a, that's an army. Okay, all armed with bows and arrows and spears, the nobles and officers wearing a leather scabbard suspended under the left arm, a large straight uh, two-edged sword, about 18 inches long and four inches broad. They were ready for whatever in Central Africa. They was totally for handling business. And they was there to protect their people and the Mwatak Zambi. They were, so believe it or not, they, they had standing militaries up there with Sparta and Greece and Rome, the inside of Africa. Okay? So let's, 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 let's continue. What did they find? They found the Muata throne and clothed with elegance. These are Europeans describing the king, a king in Africa. The Muata throne and clothed with elegance. This monarch of the far interior wore an on, on, ornamental cape, badges of royalty, bands of blue cloth trimmed with fur. What else he had? What else he had? Okay, um, light blue beads on his forearms and yellow cloth from his waist to his knees. Yeah, and, and according to uh, Gamito, Gamito, G-A-M-I-T-T-O, Gamito found the whole getup of great elegance and good taste. 
these are Europeans talking, saying that these these African leaders were uh, the whole thing was great elegance and good taste. Let that sink in. They was dressed. They was dressed. This is Central Africa. Okay. Now, and then of course, we hear about Dr. Livingston and many others traveling into Central Africa, finding out the same thing. But this is what they talked about. Okay. Because remember, there was a contrast. The coast, they were you know, in ruins, when, when they, they matriculated further, Central Africa, they found something different. And of course, Livingston uh, was, was that guy that, that, that kind of triggered the, uh, the issues with the Congo, as far as slavery that was happening in the Congo and so on. Uh, but now, after his journey through Central Africa, Livingston repeatedly commented on the peace and security that reigned over great expanses of the interior. Africa, Central Africa, Congo, Zimbabwe was a place of peace and security. Wow. It says, what looked like chaos, in short, was seldom anything of the kind. So you think on the outside looking in, oh, this is crazy. They don't, they don't know what's going on. They don't know what's happening. But that's not the case. That's not the case. They had it together. And it says, it was seldom anything of the kind. What seemed like a great danger of life was nearly always a huge exaggeration. So they, the people were saying, okay, don't go out there. Don't go to Europe. I mean, don't go to um, Africa because this is going to happen. That's going to happen or whatever. No, there was an exaggeration. Okay? But, according to the Europeans, life for the traveler in Middle Africa was, in fact, a good deal safer. Hmm. a good deal safer from wars and human killing than it generally, generally was in Europe. They're saying that it was safer. See, we always say, okay, that's just hearsay, um, you know, because we hear African scholars saying it was safer, it was better, and you're more peaceful in Europe than that of, uh, I mean, in Africa than that of Europe. It was better in places in Africa versus the Western world, according to the Westerners that went into Africa, it was peaceful there by comparison to Europe. That's what they found in Central Africa. Yeah. But let's, let's continue. Let's move on. Okay. Let me see. Then we have nomads at the gate. So we go from Central Africa, okay, the fabric of society to nomads at the gate. Now, according to the book, 70 years prior to the publishing of the book, European archaeologists found things that seemed to be a link between the ruins and the people that lived beside them. What? There was a link. There was some kind of cultural link or some kind of artifacts and things like that they found. So what, you know, what was that link? Now, according to Davidson, okay, when when they found when they found that, okay, they found uh, with the people live beside that there was some artifacts there. Now, for this decline of a civilization, three primary reasons were detected. So, three reasons, according to Davidson, was the decline, and we're gonna get to it. Okay, now there was a natural instability of the development of centralized states and kingdoms grew in rivalry with one another. Everything was not kumbaya, y'all. Everything was not um, um, peaceful or hotep in the situation. There were some uh, clashes. There were some issues among the uh, the nations. That's reality. You know, I, if I read it, I got to share it, right? There was natural instability. Number one in, of the development of centralized states and kingdoms grew in rivalry with one another. Okay, they were they were fighting. It may have gone from like a couple of individuals to family to a whole tribe and neighborhood getting into it. We see it today. Interesting natural instability. 
Okay, then there was number two, destructive invasions as nations changed leadership. Uh, some such as by Rosie, Rosie uh, would move northeast and the Portuguese would, was already there. But before I move to that, before I move to that, I'm just going to have to highlight the fact that this area in, in Africa was was full of gold. Okay? So that it was it was very minerally rich. Okay? It was it was a lot of that happening. Okay? So they 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 had it. And so resulting of those natural instabilities there were uh destructive invasions as nations changed leadership and uh, change of the guard and things like that. So um, there were some issues there. And so just to name a few, the Nguni people would try to move south. So the Bar, the Bar Rosewi or Rosvi would move northeast, but they get pushed back because the Portuguese are already finessed their way. And then the Nguni people would try to move south. But guess who's down there? There's some other people down there. You can't move here. Why? Because it's already occupied. It, you know, it's already occupied by a tribe or a nation. You just can't just invade that space. So they threw hands. Okay. And so they try to maneuver their way, right? And so there's some other things. Then the Zwanginat, is it Zwanginada? Zwanginaba came over to Limpopo with his regiment and destroyed Kami. So we have one leader going to another nation with his army and destroying another nation in Africa. This was happening. This was happening. Okay. Then what else? In 1835, the last Mambo or by Rosby, king who inherited the state which his forefathers taken from Mana Matapa was taken out. Yeah, it was happening. Okay, back and forth. Back and forth. One nation against another, one nation fighting against another. Meanwhile, Europe was snaking their way through parts of Africa, putting themselves in a strategic situation. Okay, and I think Dr. John Henry Clark said the best. He said a lot of our nations, African nations, were not overthrown outright. It was because of infighting. Understand, land is land or whatever, but you got to pay attention to what's going on. All the, all these fighting and bickering and, and and all this, not making us better. It's making it's making things worse. Sometimes we got to be really peaceful about it, right? So, yeah, they took out the uh, the Mambo, and not only him, who else got in on it? The Swazi got in on it. The, you know, and that uh, the Swazi got in on it. That, that's that's interesting because you, I hardly hear. The Swazi ever throwing hands, but I guess they threw hands too. And so the question of all this, where were where are the Zulus in this? And I asked myself that question. In in this process of studying this, you know, because this is the lost cities of Africa, of course, we should be talking about the Zulus, but of course, it, uh Davidson was highlighting some unknown groups, some groups that are not as famous. And so we know about the Zulus, but in this situation, with all this movement, where were the Zulus at? Where were they at in this situation? They basically was in the same situation. They were protecting their land too, but they had their own issues. Of course, um, in 1838, came north with the impis of um, Zilikazi, the Zulu prince who broke in from Chaka's autocratic hands. So that Zulu nation was split up. There were some issues there. Okay? So there was nomads at the gate. We're thinking people 
on the outside doing this. This is internal um, issues on the inside. Infighting. We're thinking, okay, some people on the outside are gonna come in and and or like um Greece and Rome came to Egypt or whatever, just just finagling their way, uh finessing their way. No, these were people on the inside fighting each other, going, moving from place to place, nomads at the gate. Hmm. Then the Portuguese came in, sacked and conquered, conquered the coastal cities and cut off trade links along the east coast so they they just came in and did what they they did that is the decline and fall hmm. okay of course dealing with the uh east coast check out the video on the hidden charms of zanj we talked about uh, the swahili coast much love to the fam out there uh in uh tanzania and kenya and many others all right was the gate did the gate flung was the gate flung open or was it a jar? Okay. In fifteen thirteen, there was complaints from a royal agent that the coffers and the moors were only delivering small pieces of gold. That's all they needed to hear. They said they're not giving enough gold out there. Let's investigate. Now you know how that went. You know how that went, y'all. So the Portuguese had an excuse to invade, and they have been there centuries after that, just moving around, maneuvering themselves around, playing one group against another, or just flat out pushing their way through because of gold, because they heard that they wasn't given enough. Well, first of all, um, it wasn't theirs, but, you know, so... Let's recap real quick because my time is almost up. Let's recap. Uh, What's the fabric of society? Nomads at the gate. When did the gate fl uh, flung open? Or was it, has it been ajar the entire time? Let me answer that. I think it has been kind of ajar the entire time. Somebody on the inside wanted something uh, in exchange for something else. And they kept that door cracked open or unlocked. But... Yeah, we have to we have to tell it all. We have to deal with everything. We just can't talk about the 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 high heights of Africa and there's some low points, y'all. This is history. This is our history. Okay. Now, so what's next? We we will discuss chapter twelve. We we discuss chapter twelve, more monomatapa, check out home team. Infographics, Sankofa Pan African Series, Dr. Ben, Dr. John Henry Clark, the African History Page at AE Learning. Uh, man, uh, we've got one more week to go, and uh, I'm excited. Okay, don't forget, get your copy of Wonderful Ethiopians of the Ancient Kushite Empire. Go and get you one of these. Uh, it's a it's a brief read, it's a short one. Okay, also, um, get you a journal. Midnight Sun Dreaming Art Journal. Get you one. I know it, it's on Amazon right now. I know the um it doesn't really go into detail and show you the inside, but it, this one is in color. This is in color. And of course, in Jubay means message that is out also. But some more books, some more books. Okay. Before the Mayflower uh, by Laurent Bennett. And of course, my journal in Jubay means message. It is out now. And check out the History of Africa, 4th edition, Kevin Shillington, and the Destruction of Black Civilization. That is a classic by Chancellor Williams, okay? Um, continue to pray for peace and unity in our communities, our family, uh, along the Sahel region, the Congo, Ethiopia, and Sudan, all right? Um, you just listen to the reality, chapter 11, the reality behind the ruins. I'll talk to you later. You have a good one.